Had a banana lately? Probably not. Pretty tough. But it's been tougher on some other people. Some people in one of the countries that used to be called banana republics. There's quite a story back of you not having bananas, and it's a war story. 24 hours after Pearl Harbor, the Republic of Honduras declared war on Japan. Four days later, on Germany and Italy. What did it mean to us and to them? To us, it meant solid help. Strategically near the Panama Canal, this Central American nation faces two troubled oceans. Its air patrols have helped stand guard against Axis submarines. And from the first, Honduran sailors have gone to war in the Merchant Marine of the United Nations. Half a hundred or more have already lost their lives. Others, three times torpedoed, have returned to that service as eagerly as they entered it. Hondurans are tough. But this ally has even more to contribute than its human resources. The rich tropical soil of Honduras can grow the vitally necessary war materials lost to us in the Pacific. Rubber for a hundred uses, copra, palm nut oil, abaca fiber for the manila rope needed on every freighter and warship, balsa for planes and life rafts, mahogany for PT boats. Bananas have been a proof of what Honduran soil can do. The whole north coast of Honduras was banana country, the greatest producing area in the world. It was an amazing machine for tropical agricultural production. Needing special irrigation, they developed an overhead system that threw water for a hundred yards with the sure control of a housewife watering a window box. Every phase of the work was time to the minute. Cut green, the bananas were carried to the rail lines by patient, specially trained mules. Starting with a thorough bath, the fruit begins its trip to the north coast shipping ports of Tela, La Ceiba, and Puerto Cortez. Up to the war, this fruit represented almost 70% of all Honduran exports. Thousands of men worked to produce the bananas that moved out to the markets of the world. Up the Caribbean to New Orleans and New York, across the Atlantic to England and Europe. Hondurans are good workmen, fast, careful, and thorough and their north coast was geared to get out bananas. Almost too well geared. Government revenues, wages, food, clothing, almost all of these were dependent on banana production. Bananas sent out by ships. That is, before the war. With war, there are fewer ships and higher priorities. North Coast Honduran economy stopped with a jolt. A few bananas still moved, and the fruit companies did what they could to keep men on, but thousands had to be let out, and there were thousands more dependent on them. Back on the plantations, bananas rotted on the ground. In the towns, it was men who were in danger of going to waste. Some headed for the interior, but the North Coast trouble was already meaning hunger in the hills. Most had to stay where they were. These North Coasters were United Nations manpower, men willing and able to get out the rubber, abaca, mahogany, and other materials that Honduras can produce. Planting stock for abaca can't be found overnight. Large-scale mahogany and rubber production can't be organized in a day. Shifting economic gears takes time and organization. For a man to get broke and hungry takes no time at all, or sometimes bitter. Bitterness can breed distorted thinking. On some telephone poles that fall, swastikas began to appear. Something had to be done, and something was done. At the invitation of President Carreras, the U.S. government, through the coordinator of Inter-American Affairs, sent a special emergency mission to Honduras in the fall of 1942. On an October day, 
These men of the North Coast heard what the Honduran government, this mission, and Ambassador Irwin had decided to do. They'd started by looking at a map. Tegucigalpa, the capital, has no railway. It's hard to get from coast to coast in Honduras. Hard for people, hard for goods. A narrow gauge railway starts from the North Coast ports. But it stops at Puerto Rios. From there, a truck could get through the hills to Lake Yohoa, but where it wasn't hub deep mud, it was more like a pile of rocks than a road. That's right, those tires are United Nations rubber. Those rocks could chew up a set in half a dozen trips, and it's that way straight through to Lake Yohoa, on what amounts to the only coast to coast road from the Panama Canal to Mexico. At the lake, the road gives up and it's an hour and a half ferry trip before you hit road again. Still not very good, but it takes you over the mountains to Comayagua, to Gusicalpa, and the Pacific. The bad stretch is that one from Potorios to Lake Yohoa, and the hour and a half barrier of water at $20 per car per trip. It helps make shipping costs from the coast to Gusicalpa higher than pre-war costs from New York to Buenos Aires. Corn, beans, and mahogany from the interior can't get out, and manufactured goods can't get in. And if we or Honduras ever wanted or needed to move heavy stuff fast from the Caribbean to the Pacific, and if anything happened to happen to these rickety ferry boats, the Hondurans and Americans rolled up the map. They'd found their job. During the time needed for full war conversion, Honduras, with American help, was going to fix that road from Puerto Rios and build a new one around Lake Yohoa. Man's work, and it was starting fast. Consignments of tools started for Potorius the day the agreement was signed. Selected men were drawn from every town in the North Coast. They came in in squads of 200 at a time. The first of them slept in banana cars at the Potorius railhead they built work camps out through the jungle for the hundreds more who were to follow. This was emergency work, and it was done with the materials at hand in the way the men knew. came from the forest, Manaka. Bunkhouses went up, warehouses, cook shacks, and the main body of workmen moved in. Five engineers began the job, and it was really an all-American team. Haxton from the U.S. Public Roads Administration, Luque, Colindres, and Molina from Honduras, and Montemayor from Mexico. The master carpenters, foremen, and masons laid out their jobs. Chetty men cleared the brush as the road army went into action. Nine weeks after this project started, nearly 2,000 men were usefully at work, and the road was pushing through for Lake Yohoa. Some machinery, but not much. This job wasn't asking for equipment more needed elsewhere. They used what they had, 
and improvise the rest. Yes, it's good to work again. Good to work again. And good to eat again. As the men hacked out the road, their women moved in and helped organize the camp life. The laundry was a gift from nature. Engineers helped on the water supply. And they saw to such details as drains and traps for dishwater. Meals were private enterprise, but the price for a day's board was held at half the daily wage. Later, as supplies were better organized, it dropped to a third. And every day, the road went forward. When you're short on trucks and aren't asking favors, you make out with what you can lay your hands on. Honduran workmen stack up with any in the world. Their stone is cut square and their ditches straight. It wasn't easy, though, even with good men. Not with malaria and dysentery around. That engineer lost 30 pounds the first four months of the job. The American engineer dropped more than 50. How many thousand pounds the men lost altogether would be pretty hard to count. More than earth and gravel was going into this job. While it went ahead, another job was going on. Finding and shipping in precious planting stock for the war crops that Honduras could grow. Abaca for rope, Deris for rotenone, and new food for the interior. Any road needs bridges, ditching, and culverts. This one, though, has to stand up under rains that can come down six inches a day. That means good bridges and lots of culverts, Honduran made. But each day pushes the road on and each night the men march home as from a victory. They have a right to. It's hard country. Hard to build a road in, hard to stay healthy in. That's an important building. First hospital in the project area. Dysentery and malaria. The tropical twins. But there was another team in action. Honduran doctors and a U.S. health and sanitation unit. Working together in what they call a servicio, 